It says it's preparing. You're all set. Okay. All right, great. Well, good evening. Welcome to this evening's lecture, the sixth in the spring 2021 Lawrence Technological University College of Architecture and Design lecture series. The College of Architecture and Design at Lawrence Tech offers degrees in architecture, game design, graphic design, industrial design, interior design, transportation design, and urban design. It is dedicated to a pedagogy of theory and practice which is the original motto of Lawrence Tech. We advocate not for one or the other, but both, integrated and coherent. We embrace a three-part statement of purpose, focused on design, immersed in technology, and grounded in practice. Our lecture series looks to build upon these foundations, seeking out creative leaders who are carving new paths in design, expanding current practice in architecture and design so that they might be more innovative, inclusive, and sustainable. My name is Jenna Walker. I am the director of the interiors program here at LTU. And tonight I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Heather Green. Heather is the principal and commercial studio lead at Stantec Detroit. She has been a driving force in the human-centered innovative interior environment and advancing design research throughout her nearly two decades of practice. Her diverse body of award-winning work spans multiple typologies but always with the intention to improve the quality of lives for the people that engage with the space. Heather is a dynamic leader in the design community here in Detroit and beyond. In collaboration with Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Heather recently conducted research which directly measured physiological, emotional, and cognitive well-being, as well as impacted um, as, as how it was impacted by the integration of biophilic design in the built environment. She holds lead AP and NCIDQ credentials and is an active member and past president of Crew Detroit, as well as a member of Urban Land Institute and the Future If community. Heather is a thought leader for whom I am fortunate to have had the opportunity to collaborate and engage with on many projects and also worked with her as a peer, a mentor and a friend throughout our careers. I look forward to engage, I always look forward to our engaging conversations where I come away with having learned something new and with many, many new ideas always bouncing around in my head after those conversations. So please join me tonight in welcoming Heather Green. Heather? Thank you, Jenna. And thank you everyone for spending a little bit of time um, with me this evening. And um, I hope that this presentation and our conversation can lead up to the very humbling introduction that my friend Jenna just gave me. Tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit, um, not about COVID, not about strategies to get back to the office in a, in a penalty box, um, but to talk about human focused ideas for workplaces that actually work. Um, Jenna made a great introduction. I wanna share a little bit about Stantec. Um, we are a global integrated design firm spanning sectors and expertise in architecture, interior design, engineering, urban planning, transportation, and even energy, power, and water with the goal to create the communities that we wanna be a part of. Um, you talked about theory, research, and sustainability. Those are values that we hold deeply within our organization. Um, recently, we announced that we're committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2022 and operational net zero by 2030. So we built our practice on the idea that we need to research, play and explore these ideas so that we can put them into practice and help guide our clients along the way. So I wanted to start here because I think sometimes as design professionals, we lose sight of the impact that we have on people's lives. So when you look at these three pictures, just take a moment and think about how these inventions, how these design shifts changed based on the last pandemic. The last pandemic of this scale happened in 1918 with the Spanish flu. We're on a similar trajectory. We're pushing that year and a half mark. Um, and we're looking at what might come out of this? What could we make better? Um, so simple things that we take for granted. 
half baths by the front of an entrance in your home so that the mailman or the milkman could come and wash their hands when they came into your house. Closets instead of wardrobes are spaces that were white and bright so that you could see dirt and grime. And as we're thinking about what has happened in the last year, there is a lot to unpack here. We are all feeling some level of trauma. I, I'm thankful to anyone who's on Zoom right now because we're all Zoom fatigued. We were talking about it before everyone joined. But we have other things that have happened in our society in a real meaningful way. We've had this awakening to social injustice. We're talking about equity and equality in a in more media first, but also in a more human way. We have so many natural disasters that have happened and sustainability has to be at the top of everyone's minds, especially the corporations that they're asking for, for students like you and for people like me to be a part of. So what is that impact on work? As I shared, we don't, as Stantec, like to go out and preach things that we don't take the time to understand. So the first thing we did when the world shut down in March was we started to explore and benchmark what are our clients seeing? What are they feeling? What are their employees telling them? So we launched into a global study. We measured over 140 of our client partners and companies and all of their employees to understand what were they feeling and, and in what way could design help. Um, we saw this big shift almost immediately in, in how people viewed remote work. Um, we also saw that companies started to panic a little bit and think, do I need to offload my real estate? Does, does place have a value? Is it important moving forward? And we found that it does. And I want, I want to share some of those key findings. Um, and I can share this report if anyone wants to dive into it deeper. But I want to remind everyone where we started. Before the pandemic, 30% of our clients did not support any remote work at all, it was not part of their policy. 91% expect this to continue and 26% expect it to be half or most of someone's time. So why do people wanna go back? Because they miss other people, because social cohesion is so important to our, our well being, to productivity, to innovation, to how we create things and how we evolve. That social interaction isn't the same through a screen. We can try to replicate it, but it isn't the same. And unsurprising to many designers, probably on the phone, no one missed their desk. That is not what people wanted to go back for. But when we think about place and we think about the challenge in design, in many cases is aligning design with business and making the case to our clients about the impact that design has. So if we think about the typical COVID office, and this information is from our database of 10,000 companies over the last 10 years, these are averages. 56% of a workplace typically is dedicated to own spaces. These are the me spaces, the things that I have total ownership of, whether it's a desk or an office. The rest is to the we spaces. And so Historically, we've tried to balance the me needs and the we needs. And so does that stay the same? Is that how we should be moving forward? So we wanted to step back and this is a graphic that we go back to a lot. You've seen this from Maslow. What this is, is Maslow's hierarchy of needs with a design point of view layered over it. That before any of the meaningful work can happen, before people can achieve innovation, create the next big thing, to improve productivity or workflows, to get to that purposeful and meaningful work, we have to first establish trust. And this doesn't just apply to the workplace, this applies to schools, this applies to experiences like retail and hospitality, this applies to travel because we need to be empathetic in remembering that everyone is on a different risk tolerance spectrum and everyone is at a different place of fear. Some have no fear and they're ready to go back, Others are ready to go back, but, but with some precautions in place. And so establishing first within the building that we're meeting people's physiological and safety needs. So that isn't just that we're protecting them from a virus, that's that we're supporting health and well-being. 
that we are thinking about the impact that place has on how people feel. Um, and once we do that, once that is met, then we can start to dive into experiential design. But if I don't feel safe and I don't feel like my basic needs are being met, I won't wanna send my kids to school. I won't wanna to go to a stadium. I won't wanna go back to the office. So it's just a reminder that place has so much of an impact on how people live their lives. So what is the value of place moving forward? We believe that the future office is going to skew to the we. It's gonna to skew to collaboration, community and experience, potentially at the expense of status, hierarchy and space. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and sit here for a minute. Um, some of you may be aware, if, you, if you're into some of the retro TV sitcoms, you've, um, you've watched Mad Men, you, you, will, you will know that the typical cubicle farm in its infancy was born out of the office revolution in World War II. So when everyone came back from service in World War II, most of them were in the military and they took that hierarchical perspective and applied it to how organizations were structured. We've seen some shifts to flatten organizations to make them more collaborative, more equitable, but we haven't seen massive shifts in place to support that. And one of the pushbacks to the open office besides privacy and noise um, is that space has traditionally been tied to a reward system. My office, executive row, is the physical representation of my value to the organization. Now we're all on an equal playing field and there are things that people aren't gonna be willing to give up easily. The biggest one of those is choice. Um, we've talked about choice for a long time. I'm sure you've talked about it in your classes or you've read about it online, but it was an inauthentic version of choice. It was once you came to the office between the hours of eight and nine, you had a choice perhaps on if you wanted to sit at your desk, if you wanted to sit in a conference room, if you wanted to work in a work cafe. Now we need to think bigger and we need to think about choice of where and when and how. And so when we start thinking about that, it becomes more authentic to who that person is as an individual. The challenges become, how do we start to evolve the things that are traditionally slower to catch up? The tools and training, how do we train managers to manage remote teams? How do we train new employees, people graduating from college and entering in the workforce connected to opportunities like mentorship or resources or this shared community and culture? Second, and we throw this word around a lot about experience, but I want you to frame the idea of experience through a couple of things, through personalization and through the lens of empathy. So we have in interior design, especially in, in workplace design, we're the worst of all. Um, we've approached these iterations of a one size fits all solution. We called it the open office. We called it activity based work. We call it neighborhood planning. We've given it lots of fancy names, but essentially it was one slight modification of everyone is the same and everyone needs the same things. And it's an interesting dichotomy in the workplace because people are not the same. So Jenna, I'm gonna pick on you. Jenna and I are both interior designers. We both have very similar interests, similar passions, but the way that I get into flow may not be the same that Jenna does. Many people don't believe this about me because my job requires me to be very external and sometimes to feel like I'm always on, but I'm very much an introvert and where I get my best ideas is by myself without interruption. And so for me to get into flow, I need to have my music playing in the background. I have my rituals that kind of help me. And just because Jen and I are the same, perhaps on paper, we're both interior designers with a similar level of experience. We both have similar interests. Doesn't mean that we require the same tools. The other piece about meaningful work goes back to this idea on the model for innovation. And what that means is, and if you look this up at its base level, if I don't see you and I don't start to get to know you, I will never take a risk with you and I will never actually innovate. So this idea of social collisions, opportunities for people to see each other and get to know each other are so important. And it's why we believe, and I wholeheartedly believe 
why no one wants to go back to an office if you're barricaded within a bunch of plexiglass. Because if I can't even get a cup of coffee and talk about what's going on in our day, how are those social cohesions creating people getting to know each other? Ultimately, place is the physical representation of culture. So whether it's a workplace or whether you're designing another type of facility, your first impression, that front door moment, that arrival experience sets the tone for your culture all the way through. And so we need to think about what are the actual experiences that people are so desperate for. And then I, I wanna talk about wellness and I'm gonna circle back to biophilic design. So I'm just gonna kind of leave that in the background. When we think about wellness, we have a duty to go beyond meeting people's physical needs. If you have an ergonomic task chair or a sit stand desk, or you're meeting the basic principles of clean air, that's great, but we can do better. We need to do better. Um, and there's opportunities for that. We need to think beyond the physical and start to think about cognitive health, mental fitness, and social emotional well being. I think if we can start to find and hold on to some of the silver linings of COVID, one of the silver linings is this level of vulnerability that we now have with each other that didn't exist before. Um, if you talk to some of your professors or some of your mentors, there used to be this MO that you kind of left your stuff at the door, your personal stuff, and you showed up to work. Showed up to work with your game face on and whatever you were going through was kind of hidden behind that facade. Now we're in this really interesting dynamic. Where we're inviting people into our homes. They're seeing our children, they're hearing our dogs. Maybe you didn't mute quite fast enough and they heard you yelling at your child or your spouse or your partner. Um, or they see that your roommate's a slob and they left a bunch of dishes in the sink. It's allowing us to get to know each other on a deeper level, even though we're so disconnected. And there's value in that. Um, there's value in supporting our social emotional wellness by leading with empathy and understanding how all of this is interconnected. And then I wanna to talk to you about joy for a minute. This has been a tough year. I, I haven't met anyone who hasn't said that this hasn't been a tough year for them in some way or the other. And if we're fortunate enough to have not had, had death affect us, um, then we're coming at it from a slightly different point of view. Joy is something that we're spending a lot of time diving into. It's a big goal for us to understand the impact that design has on people's ability to feel joy. Um, I wanna back up and explain that while we sometimes use them interchangeably, happiness and joy are not the same thing. Happiness is feeling good or content over an extended period of time. Joy are these intense moments of positive emotions. And so what, if you start to think about that, what opportunities do we have in design to create moments of joy? Could it be through our senses? Could it be through awe? Could it be through relationships? And then what's the value? Well, if you dive into it a little bit deeper, the value has both social, emotional, cognitive and physical benefits. Physically, when people experience moments of joy, their central nervous system regulates. Your brains release dopamine and serotonin. You, you feel like you feel um, after you've worked out or after you've just had this great experience. And we also have this opportunity where our thinking, our creativity and our attention start to broaden when we feel joy. So we are challenging ourselves and we're just at the beginning of it to really start to think about what is the connection between physical place and our emotional selves and what role does joy play in that? So how do we get there? What are the, what are the barriers here? And the barriers here, um, the one that's not written on there is probably that companies are still scared. They don't know where to spend their money. They don't know how to attack this first. And I think that when we throw out words like hybrid or evolving office, they look at it and go, okay, where do I start? Um, and they realize that it, it's, it's harder than they think it's going to be to get there. So there's some big macro shifts that need to happen in order for this to work. And the biggest thing is we need to start to educate 
the community, the business community about what we're measuring and is that valuable? So we've traditionally only looked at things like square foot per person, how, how much square feet does someone own? My desk is, you know, my desk and space take up 350 square feet. Let's dial that down to 275. Great, we're saving money. Um, you know, what if we dust share? Now we're saving even more money. What we're not measuring are the things that are actually meaningful. So one of the cases that, that we, we talk to clients because fortunately or unfortunately, the opportunity that exists in design is we have to think about business and design hand in hand because it has to make sense to be implemented. And we have, we have an opportunity and a duty to bring our clients along with us. If they don't get it, then how are we explaining it and how can we help them get there? So things like engagement, innovation, sense of belonging, access to technology, those are the things that have direct impact on productivity. And most companies, when we look at their spend, they spend eight to 10% on technology, 10 to 12% on real estate, and 80% of their spend is on people, their salaries, benefits, training, and mentorship. So instead of trying to see as designers, how can we squeeze more out of this 10 to 12? I hated the phrase, how can we have it work harder, work smarter? We're asking them to shift. What happens if we shift our focus onto people? How can we start to measure human ROI? How am I accessing my purpose, my meaning, and what is the productivity, innovation, creativity that's gonna come out of that? Because ultimately that's, what, that's what's gonna shift the conversation. And then we're starting to see more and more of a blending of typologies. So things we're seeing in hospitality, things we're seeing in higher education, things we're seeing in R&D spaces, labs. You talked about transportation design. Our automotive clients are really thinking about how do we bring people back in a meaningful way because you can't bring an R&D lab to your home, it doesn't work. So we're looking at things like maker spaces, team rooms, where can people have ownership for long-term and then for short moments of time? What are we doing to the site? What are we doing to the spaces? We have to rethink amenities. Are we providing technology in these beautiful outdoor spaces so that they actually work? And then we need to think about connectivity. What are my access to resources? Whether it's learning, whether it's people, whether it's wellness or tech, Ultimately, what we don't want to do is leave anyone behind, not see people promoted because they're not being seen. We want to create areas for social cohesion. And tech is so much a part of this conversation, not because tech needs to be the lead, but because technology should be the underlying layer of everything that we're doing so that the experience is seamless. Connecting to people, connecting to space, and connecting to amenities should be as easy as it is for me to download an app on my phone. And if it isn't, it isn't going to work. And so thinking about when we start to individualize and personalize the office, how can technology enable us to do that in a more meaningful way? Can I adjust the temperature and the lighting in a focus zone? Can I shift the blinds? Can I actually take ownership of the room? What does control actually mean? And what does personalization actually mean? And, and do I have that choice within this place? And lastly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on something that's near and dear to, to my heart. Um, my team here in Detroit, we, we had the privilege of partnering with Harvard on a study about biophilic design that we actually started three years ago. Um, and I'll tell you a quick funny story. Um, it took a very long time to, to go through and collect all the data conduct the study and then go through the peer review process, which in the educational community meant that the data was valid enough. The case for the data meant that the community of peers felt like this was valid and this was something that we could take out to the world. And we were ready to publish it the first week of March in 2020 with the embarrassing title in hindsight that luxury or that wellness will be the next competitive advantage um, and we scrapped that title and we pulled it off of what was supposed to be a news release and a media release. And we said, we cannot go in and talk about wellness as a luxury. Wellness is not something that should be allocated for a few. Um, we need to think about this in a more equitable way. 
And so what we did was we used Harvard has a virtual reality lab, which helped us to control the environment more so that we could actually start to measure people's physiological, cognitive, and social emotional data points within the study. So we had participants, you can see in the diagram, actually go into virtual reality. It was a place where they could walk around, they had a computer, um, and they had some time to acclimate to the environment. But the goal was to allow them to actually do the tasks that they would do in their normal workflow to measure a couple of things. So what did we see? We saw all physiological scores improve heart rate, heart rate variability, blood pressure, and then really interestingly, something called a skin conductance level test, which is essentially your body's physical reaction to stress. So we saw blood pressure go down. We saw people get calmer in these spaces. And then we did cognitive tests and we wanted to study innovation. So creativity, we use something called an alternatives use test, which is a psychological test to understand how innovative, not I am over someone else, but how innovative I am in one environment to another. We also used something that measured computational tasks. So the processing, the different parts of your brain. Um, and then I will mention real briefly, we were not expecting to see how much demographics played a role in the level of impact of biophilic design. We saw that people who were raised in suburban and rural environments spent longer, significantly longer, almost 30% of their time looking at the biophilic environments compared to their urban counterparts. We also saw an impact, a stronger impact in females over males, which helped us further to reinforce that one size doesn't fit all. You shouldn't put this everywhere. It shouldn't be everything, but it has opportunities to apply these patterns in meaningful ways to support the different types of workflows that people have. So where do we go from here? Um, we hope that hopefully we've inspired some of you today to think about how do we design spaces that are more human focused? What do people actually need when they leave their homes? Do they need moments of joy? Do they need places of respite where they can recharge their batteries and feel connected to something bigger than themselves? Do they need social cohesion? Do they need a best friend at work? Or do they need a really great experience that starts to create joy? Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. And I hope that you have some great questions that I can answer or some dialogues that we can start. Thank you, Heather. I think that was really interesting to start to think about where we're heading. Um, I'll get you started with a question while we uh, wait for some students to chime in. I'm wondering if you have any projects that are, are beginning to look at this, um, you know, where project, you have clients that are planning on coming back and when that is, and what types of changes are they making to projects that maybe were already in progress that have shifted now because of what we've seen happen over the last year? That's a really great question. So we have a few clients that we've been working with since April to start prototyping some new technology, I think is the biggest one. Um, we have one very future focused tech client where we are piloting a smart office update that adds additional sensors to support cleaning. So there's a little Rosie the robot that comes in with a UV germicidal radiation that sprays all of the surfaces in high density areas. So areas that are constantly populated, we're seeing those, we're seeing more and more of a drive for touchless community spaces. So things like, do I have to open the door? Do I have to touch the elevator button that 10,000 other people have touched and it's probably never been wiped down? Um, you know, what are those kind of small things that we can do to mitigate a virus? So to think about surfaces and cleanability. Um, on the bigger macro side, we are seeing our clients starting to question that percentage of amenity, the we to the me. Um, I think what clients are uh, getting a, a little bit too aggressive on is the fact that me spaces don't matter at work anymore. And so there's no one that's going to collaborate for eight hours a day. We have to remember that people still need to focus. They still need to recharge and they still need to have social connections. Now, the percentage of ownership, we believe, will continue to shift. 
Um, our clients that have global footprints, this is their biggest fear right now. What percentage of my office do I give up? Um, and, and help how they're asking us to help them justify um, the value of place. But if this is working, why, why do some people want to come back? Well, should we bring people back? Now, you mentioned global clients. Are there different, are you hearing from them different cultural per perceptions on post-COVID workplace and how this is going to impact their, their teams on a global scale? Yeah, so globally we're headquartered in Canada and I will say our Canadian counterparts have been a little bit more future focused on health and wellness um, within their communities. They're taking their precautions and their stay at home orders um, a little bit more stringently than some of our other studios are feeling in their local communities. Our European counterparts also, um, they're thinking a little bit more work from home is the data that we're getting back than we are here in the States. On average, we're seeing the US clients report one to three days remote. Now the problem becomes, if I'm really after social cohesion, one to three days remote limits the percentage of opportunity I have to connect to the people I really need to connect to. So I think the most important thing we're trying to remind clients of is that this is something we need to prototype. We're not through this enough to understand which things will remain for the long haul. The things we believe will remain for the long haul are choice, wellness, and experience. It seems like those were also trends that were already starting and they've just been like fast forwarded in motion to be even more important than, than they were, even though we were seeing them as emerging. I, I think you're absolutely right. It catapulted things that were already in place. Um, we were talking about smart office, but the barrier to entry was cost. And now we're seeing, you know, supply and demand. We're seeing the cost for some of this technology come way down so that companies can afford it and they can actually start to implement it. On the well-being side, we were talking about this. We were talking about well buildings. We were talking about, you know, lead certification. But were we practicing what we preach to, you know, to that level? I, I don't know if we were. I think that as an industry, we, we started with the low hanging fruit, which was how do we meet people's physical needs? Now I'm really excited about the fact that we're talking about social emotional health. Um, I, I think that most people who've been in this industry for a long time, if we had talked about social emotional wellness 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I can say most of the C-suites that I've presented to probably would have laughed me out of the room. Now that's the conversation they wanna have and that's what's really exciting. I have a question here in the chat. So I, a member of the audience was, uh, actually went to Herman Miller um, about a decade ago. And when they had, when they built their new greenhouse and the, they actually asked employees there at the time what they felt about that building and what the best part of working in that building was. And they still said the people, and I know you and I know this, right? The research always tells us environment is in those top three, but it's always number one is the people. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why, I know you, you mentioned this, but why that physical environment is important to that connection with those people? You know, I think it's a couple of things. I think that we're, tri we're tribal animals by, by nature. We, we've, we've always built, if we go back in time, we didn't hunt and gather by ourselves. We created communities. And so if we unpack that a little bit, our, our gyms are our fitness community, the schools are our children's community and work is our community outside of our family. It's an extension of that. I also think as human beings to get to that top level of Maslow's pyramid, our work has to be purposeful. Otherwise we're just collecting a paycheck and we're checked out and we're not engaged and we're not fulfilled and the company is not happy. But ultimately when we think about why this is so hard, and this is so hard. Um, I posted something earlier today on Instagram that I found so inspiring. And they were talking about, why are people not talking? Like, why does no one want to talk right now? And it's because we weren't designed to communicate only this way. We miss each other. Do I think that people will never hug again? No. 
Do I, do I think that people won't ever gather in mass? No, I think that we're seeing the importance of it. This is a moment in time and it's reminding us how much that connectivity matters. So what is place? Place is an opportunity to foster healthy, supportive, equitable communities, equitable connections. And I think that that's really the opportunity here. And that's why people, that's why people are having such a hard time. We don't want to look at each other through a screen. There's an energy that's missing that you have when people come together. It always reminds me of Wally and how if you've watched the cartoon with your, you have a son too, so I'm sure you have, but you know, they're all attached to their screen and living only in their screen and they completely lose sense of that connection. And Sometimes with social media, we felt we were going that way, but I think something like this happens and you realize that that digital connection is not, is not a replacement. It's, like, not, it's not a replacement. And I, I think the biggest thing it doesn't replace is that energy that you feel, you know, we, it used to be when you could go into the airports and wait for someone at the gate and you saw someone you hadn't seen in a long time running at you off of, you know, the terminal, there's an energy about that. And so um, when we sometimes preach about joy or experience, I mean, this is our opportunity. How cool is it that we all get to play a role in shaping people's experiences? And so we can do it well, and we can, you know, we can create these moments where people can come together in meaningful ways and feel like I'm a part of this, um, or we can do them really poorly and just go back to the way that it was and, you know, maybe, maybe we'll all be happy to um, get, get coffee and stand around a bad kitchen, but I, I think that we can do better. And I think that everyone on the phone is here because they want it to be better. Heather, I think a big part of how some of this is gonna play out is how we are introducing ourselves back to society. And I've been fortunate enough to have a couple of dialogues with some sociologists and anthropologists at, at some of the major furniture manufacturers in the past couple of weeks. And what I thought was just my own personal introversion is it's not, it is a definite thing that those people are talking about that we have not been introduced to one another for over a year now. And there, there is a little bit of, um, you know, holding back, like the part of it is, I don't, you know, people are thinking, yes, I want to go back to the office, but I haven't seen anybody in a year. And it's, it's like, we all need to reintroduce ourselves to one another. And I think a key part of it is what are those spaces going to look like? And, what is the corporate culture going to do to support that? Because as Jenna mentioned, some of this has been in play for a while. We've been looking at different pallets of place and how people collaborate, but they don't need eight hours of it. They do need the focus time and they need the me time and the we time and all of that. But the, the corporate culture has to be there to support that. Um, in the past, we've seen some are on board and some aren't. Have you seen any increases in, in the short year that we've been kind of doing things from a different perspective or is it, is it kind of remaining the same or are people just, they just don't know because they don't have the answers yet. So you, you hit on a couple, a couple, like three different things I just want to touch on because I think it's such a great point that you brought up. Um, I was listening in to um, a local doctor, a local psychotherapist who's in the Wayne State University educational community the other night. And they were talking about building resilience in kids. And as a parent, especially of a seven, seven year old only child who's you know desperate for other kids to play with, um, it was really it was really impactful to me. But one of the things that she spoke about that Dr. Bachnick spoke about that I thought, is really important to our conversation is context. And so when we start to measure and think about these things, if we went back five years ago and someone was in a grocery store with a mask, a face mask and gloves on, we would have said, who is, who is calling in the police or the mental health? We wouldn't have understood. We would have thought that there might be some underlying disorder. Now we're all doing it because the context has shifted. 
Now, um, and Len, I think we spoke about this with your class a couple months ago. If we go back to something that many of us can remember, if we went back to September 11th, there was some short term context that shifted the conversation. When I went into an airport and I had to travel just a couple weeks after 9-11 happened, there was military personnel guarding the airport terminals with machine guns strapped to their back. And it was eye-opening to me. It was, it, it induced fear, kind of gave me a fear moment. It gave me stress because I wasn't used to, that wasn't part of my context. I wasn't used to seeing military personnel with machine guns. It wasn't something that I had experienced before. Now that didn't remain, but what did is the the level of security that we're used to, that we take off our shoes, that if someone wants to pat down our hands, we're just kind of like, okay, do what you need to do because I wanna travel. So the context around short-term and long-term I think is incredibly important because people are gonna be coming back with an individualized risk tolerance. I think one of the things that we're seeing happening in the, in the news and on social media is we're seeing this kind of polarization of do you agree with me? Do I agree with you? Especially because we're all on our phones all day long. Um, and so we're starting to see this shaming when it's, it, in my point of view, it's, it's really disappointing because we should be a little bit more empathetic that people have different risk tolerances. Someone who maybe has a, a spouse or themselves has an underlying health condition, they're going to be more fearful to come back and expose themselves to more people, whether they're an introvert or, or an extrovert. Um, someone who COVID thankfully hasn't touched in any meaningful way might be more risk tolerant to just come back and be in a crowd. And all of those are okay. We just need to understand that not everyone's entering back into the workplace at the same moment in time, the same fear level. Do I think companies are shifting? Absolutely. I think that these conversations, these words are something that didn't hold value to a C-suite a year ago. I, I don't think that they did. I think that they knew they wanted people to be innovative. They knew they wanted their teams to be productive. And they knew that the cost of healthcare, people being out sick wasn't a good thing. One of the things I hope never comes back is like being sick at the office doesn't make you a hero. It doesn't, We do, this isn't good. Um, someone, one of my executives threw this out a couple months ago and I loved it and he said, I'm hearing from members on my team that they're really loving having lunch with their kids. So I'd really like you to move these meetings so that no one's lunch hour is interrupted. Let's give people back their lunch hour. So some of these small shifts, I think build up to that macro shift of, of wellness and of what's really important. And, and I don't think we've had that conversation in, in workplace design before. I think that's a great point. And if, if I'm not mistaken, I believe it was about a year ago, February, well, it was probably starting in November um, and maybe just a little before that where Marissa Meyer, CEO of Yahoo was saying the open office, people working remote doesn't work. And I remember there was this shift going through like the open office plan is not gonna work. We need to bring people, everybody's gotta come back to the office. And if, I believe there was a study done in February or March of last year that most corporations felt remote work was not possible. Mm -hmm. And then COVID hit in March, everything shut down. And that has totally shifted their thought process 180 degrees because I believe 95 to 99% of corporations can work remotely. And it was this eye-opening experience that kind of shook things up and they realized that they, they have to look at it through a different lens that a year ago, they, there was no way they would have said that this was going to happen, that we would yeah. let all yeah. these people. We had similar research. Ours showed 30% who didn't believe and 91% who expected it to remain. I think the part that we're not talking about yet, but we should, um, is the equitable job experience and the safety levels for the people who can't work remote. And I don't think that as a community, that's a conversation that we've dove deep enough into. So when we go back to that Maslow, that basic safety and physiological needs, if I'm a frontline worker in a hospital or a grocery store or a factory, are we actually meeting their basic needs? And um, as designers, I think that um, we have to step, we have to step it up a little bit and make sure that before we do anything else, before we, we do this great graphic wall or this beautiful art installation, 
we've got to do better for people and make sure that we're, we're really supporting them as a barrier to entry, as a, as a barrier to here is the building. Um, that needs to be part of everything we do. And I think, I think myself, all of us, I think we can all do better. That's a great we point. Talk, we talk a lot about technology and the integration of all of these emerging technologies. And they have, as you said, they have been permeating the market, but not at any really significant level. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that from you. Like, are they, are you finding companies of all sizes? Is it still something, you know, if the, the demand is high enough, prices are coming down, are there ways that smaller companies and organizations are, are entering this, you know, kind of high, high tech smart office realm as well? Yeah, I, I, it's not, it's not as deep as it could be. I don't think that a company with 20 employees right now can afford the barrier to entry. I hope that they can. I hope that as we continue to drive, and I think there's two different parts of technology. There's the smart office IOT piece that's um, managing the building and managing the business operations. Yes, where are people? How dense are spaces? Can I open the door for you? Um, and then the, there's the experiential side of work, which is, do I have on-demand access to reserve spaces? How can I start to make this, um, to Len's point, you know, more equitable so that people at different fear levels, if I'm a little bit nervous to come in and I want a private space, can I reserve that in advance? Um, we're piloting a couple of things in Calgary right now where they're still a little bit more hesitant to come back to the office. Simple building shifts like lights on a building that would tell you that this elevator lobby is a little crowded right now. Maybe you want to sit in your car for 10 more minutes. Maybe you want to take a little me time or take a walk outside. Um, just little signal cues to help people understand here's what's happening in the space that you're in. Then we have the cleaning side where we can start to automate some of those things. Um, the other piece that's really interesting that's just starting to emerge is equitizing digital presence. So if half your team is remote and half your team is in person, how do people still have an equal voice in the conversation? And there's a lot of new things that I don't think have been tested enough for me to feel comfortable weighing in that they're going to work. We are seeing things like, and your gaming designers probably have really great ideas about this. Um, some technology companies are piloting virtual reality spaces. So instead of eight people being in a conference room and two people feeling remote or two people being remote and the remote people not having an equal voice in the conversation, could you go into a virtual room um, and what would that look like? Would it look like you're entering a game? What would that feel like? Does that work? Does that, does that virtual reality experience create the same experience that human to human does? Um, I am not the expert in gaming design. I would defer to your very talented group of professors and students. But to me, I think what's really interesting about that is that I believe that Zoom and Teams and all of these things that while we're sick of them right now, those will remain. How do they continue to improve? Ultimately, when I think about designing for people, it's got to be as easy as using my phone. If it's harder than this, it's not worth the money. And so the opportunity is how do we start to create this virtual and physical connection with technology. You touched a nerve there. I think I watched every faculty member here kind of shake their head because we are doing just that. You know, we're teaching both remote and on ground simultaneously in many of our classes as our students have choice if they're on campus or not. And I think thinking about that, how to continue to elevate that is a really important conversation because there is some disparity there and how 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 equitable those experiences it's just human nature to kind of automatically direct your attention towards one or the other and you have to be very very cognizant of that throughout your engagement so i'd be really interested to hear is there anything that's worked really well or anything that you you tried that just absolutely didn't work i think from my perspective it's one or the other I have had the most success with either everybody on ground in a room or studio or everybody online. Because when we do the hybrid thing, it's, there's, it's, it's unequal. There's people that can't see what's being presented, um, especially when you're remote. It's just, it's difficult to try to make sure everybody can hear, see, 
And then if you get into, like I teach a class on materials, how do you share the tactile experience of looking at carpeting or wood or marble with somebody on a, t on a screen? That's, that's the part that, that part just doesn't work. So that's, that's yes. <laughs> to me, it's gotta be one or the other. That's my well, personal experience. And most of your students, I would imagine, have fairly regular technology, you know, have devices at home. We work a lot. One of the things I, I just love, I get so geeked up about about Stantec is we put cross-functional teams together to work through these issues. So when we were talking about COVID planning, you know, we started having conversations around what is a basic human right in 2020. If school is online, is internet a basic human right? Is this something that we need to start thinking about in the communities that we design? Um, you know, it starts to beg a different question around what is the world we wanna live in? And I think that we can get lost in drawings and specifications and the project right in front of our face sometimes and forget that each building we build is defining the community that we're saying we want to have. You know, you earlier mentioned um, being in the penalty box, which I love that analogy because I didn't view it that way, but that's exactly what it is. Uh, I like your idea of the possibility of using VR to provide some equity because I know of a number of companies who have split their employees and group A goes to work on Monday, Wednesday, and group B goes on Tuesday, Thursday, and then Friday is kind of a free-for-all. If you need to be in the office, you have to sign up to make sure we don't meet certain capacities and things like that. But what I'm hearing from those groups are that it isn't always the same when somebody's remote and then there's a group in the office and you have six in a conference room and two on the video screen. So the whole idea of uh, VR bringing equity to that I think is great. So Carl, I'm gonna charge you with that in the workshop we have here in a couple of weeks. I wanna I want to explore that. But that's a really good point. I didn't I didn't even think of something like that. So Carl shaking his head no. We're not doing that. Only because that's not, not that's not what's planned, but we, we should think about those things. I, that's it's a great thing to think about. It it really is. It's it's pushing that idea further and how do we provide equity? You know, I pivot. Oh. Our, our really future focused clients, um, and I, I'm talking the tech companies that have always pushed the barriers that believe in physical space, know that you can't just go into Teams, you can't just go into Zoom and have the same experience. So some of the prototypes I've seen um, are so interesting in that they're thinking about what is my virtual reality experience as it relates to light, as it relates to sound, as it relates to energy? Um, you really almost, and I'm one of those people that always gets dizzy in virtual reality. So when I heard about this, I'm like, oh my God, I'm not gonna survive. Um, but it, it really is dynamic. The other thing that we're talking about with clients when it comes to that equity is remembering that connection isn't about having, you know, having a, I don't have to talk to Jenna every single day to have a relationship with her. So being intentional with how you bring people together. So I always use the analogy of a retreat. And if anyone's been a part of a corporate retreat, you can have 20 meetings with the same group of people or have one day offsite having a different experience and you gain so much more from that. So I guess I, I would throw out there and challenge, you know, we do a lot of projects for Dow and they have these beautiful gardens and, and ropes courses you know, what would happen if your team spent a day on a ropes course outside climbing a wall and working through something as opposed to eight days sitting in a boring conference room? And so the impact of place becomes, are we actually designing places that people want to be in? Or are we pulling and dragging people back because we need to see them in order to educate them, in order to mentor them, in order to train them and make sure they're productive? Um, and I think the really important part of choice is we, we've equitized that. We're not saying that because someone's senior, they get to work remote or because you're junior, you have to be here at a certain time. I, I think all that's out the window at this point. And if it isn't, they're probably not going to attract and retain the people they want. Heather, uh, can you hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, quick uh, question. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, a slightly bit off topic. Uh, LEAD is a well-established rating system. Uh, clients, uh, you know, lean more towards now well, or there are other rating systems that uh, focus on health and well-being. Have you seen that hike up uh, or, uh, you know, clients more interested in doing that instead? So I think lead, set, lead started the conversation. I think there's a lot of great things about lead that focus more on our environmental footprint and a little bit on human health. What I real, what I personally really like about the well system is it starts to find more of those human factors. Ultimately, what I'm seeing is a lot of clients want to design and build with those methodologies in place, maybe not necessarily go through the certification process, which is lengthy. I think that there's going to be more and more an expectation that we're designing with those things in mind um, and, and furthering even the conversation around carbon, around mass timber, around our environmental footprint. Um, these were things we, we talked about in a small way a couple of years ago. Um, and I, I mean, I had to take a crash course in carbon from our internal experts because I'm always being asked about carbon and how do these buildings start to live the values that these companies are preaching, which I think is a good thing. Just means we need to stay on top of our game and keep educating ourselves. Well, Heather, I'm gonna pivot you. I have a question from the chat. And the student wants to know if you could explain a little more about how biophilic design is more or less effective based on the demographic, like you mentioned. Could you talk sure. about that a little more? Sure. So we took some basic demographics when we were starting the study. So um, we took male, female, non, you know, non-binary. We took where they grew up. So just in a sense of rural, suburban, urban. Um, and then we also took, you know, some basic demographics just to understand their health, how many hours they slept the night before. We made sure that they came back to the virtual reality lab on the same date and time over a period of a couple of weeks. We limited how much caffeine they had. Did they drink alcohol the night before? Um, and so we just wanted to make sure that when we were measuring, we were measuring the same person against themselves, not how am I, am I more innovative than someone else? Ultimately, what we saw was that females spent more time focusing on biophilic elements. Um, I didn't dive into this too much. We saw a U-shaped curve where when we, when we had environments that had 40 to 60% of the elements as biophilic, and it wasn't that 40% of the walls were covered in moss or the room was filled with 40% plants per square foot. It was that we layered principles around lighting around texture, biomorphic patterns if we were replicating things in nature. So women focus longer, their attention, we used eye tracking data in their virtual reality classes to study and get data points on what they were looking at and for how long. So we saw women focused on biophilic elements more than men, and we saw suburban and rural focus more than urban. Um, so that was really interesting for us because we weren't expecting to see that. It was data that we didn't anticipate. Um, and what I think it shows and one of the basic principles of biophilia is that the connection to nature has to be authentic. So if I live in the Southwest, it makes a lot of sense to bring in, you know, clay and terracottas and the colors of nature that wouldn't resonate here with us in Michigan. We want to be connected to the environment that we're a part of. Um, I was actually expecting the urban counterparts. I'm like, hey, where's my Manhattanites extended family? Aren't you going to be excited to see a tree? And, the, you know, that was kind of in the background for them. So that was really interesting for us. Again, circling back to context. What is the community that I'm designing for? And if anyone's interested, Jenna, I'll share the link with you or Emily. You can read the whole study. You can actually read the whole peer review paper. Um, both are online. If you go to the Stantec website, you can look up my name and you'll see the articles. Um, and then it'll connect you directly to um, Harvard's page so you can read the peer review paper. Great, thank you. Did you have a question? Someone have a question? I thought I saw a hand raised. I have a question. Can you hear me? I br you briefly touched on um, kind of the experience us as students are gonna have once we graduate and enter the field. 
Um, do you think we'll be at a disadvantage or have any um, hindrance going into the field? It's, it's going to be largely virtual um, compared to actually being in the office. It's a really good question. I, I think that our company and most companies are really focused on mentorship. When you're, when you're bringing someone in that's a great fit for the company, it's a great question. First of all, Alyssa, thank you for asking it. Um, you need to feel connected to your team and you need to feel like you have a voice and you can ask questions and you can challenge things. And so is that harder if you're never meeting them face to face? Um, I think that we're, we're trying to work through that and trying to improve. There's a great graphic, I'm blanking on the author's name, but it talks about the levels of remote work. And it's a similar kind of Maslow diagram that just shows like, if you're replicating the in-office experience on Teams, this is all the reasons why it doesn't work. And here's all the other things you need to do to improve that. So if you haven't seen that, I would highly encourage you to look at that. One of the things that we did was we, we didn't want our interns to lose their internship last summer. And so we were worried about how do we acclimate them onto projects and how do they learn and understand our standards. And I think not just architecture and engineering studios, but all companies are, are trying to figure this out. And so we actually had 40 interns across the company in all different disciplines. And we gave them a similar challenge as to how do you kind of design, we give one team education and one team workplace. And we had them, you know, kind of prototype some things that they were thinking about, we were thinking about, and then pitch them back to the design leadership. Some things that I, I would recommend or suggest, um, if the company you're working for isn't doing this, try to get it started. Simple coffee connects. And even if you're just looking for an internship or a job, I don't know very many professionals um, in our network, especially here in Detroit, that if you reached out to them on LinkedIn and said, could I have... 20 to 30 minutes for an informational meeting because I found this about you and I'm really interested in it. I, I would say almost no one would say no to that. Um, so I think taking the time to have one-on-one -on -one connections, even if they're brief, um, to, just, to just share what you're interested in and, and learn from them is a really great way to start building connections, even if they're virtual. Thank you. When you think about, we've seen so much research on Gen Z and how they're digital natives and they don't look towards mentorship and some of the interpersonal connections that the previous generations do. And it makes me wonder if, we're, if they are going to feel like they're missing that or if we feel like they're going to be missing that. I mean, I'd probably be more interested to hear the, the students that, you know, are going through that, what, what you think. I think that Jenna, you're probably right. It's probably a combination of both. Um, you know, I'm sometimes surprised if, you know, I get a lot of emails about jobs or internships. And if it's like an absolute no, either we're not hiring or it isn't the right fit. I always try to offer at least 15 minutes. Like, hey, if you want 15 minutes to have coffee, we don't have something right now, but maybe I know someone that does. Um, and my personal MO on that is, um, every career advancement and, and big client opportunity that I've had is from someone in my network, is from someone recommending us or recommending me. Um, my job at Stantec didn't exist. It wasn't posted. They wanted to expand and build this studio when, when Stantec made the commitment to come into the Detroit market. And it was through a referral. Someone said, you should talk to Heather. She's the right person to lead this. So I think that whether it's virtual or in person, um, in some ways we're forgetting and in other ways we're desperately craving those types of relationships. So put yourself out there. The worst thing someone can say is, no, I don't have time this week. Um, you know, call me back next month. I had more of just like a comment. Um, I appreciated, uh, the switch from, I, I had previously visited like Herman Miller and Steelcase and they had talked about the benefits of a flexible office being increased productivity. Mm -hmm. And I, I really appreciated your approach to it as more of an increased wellness rather than productivity. Um, and yeah, I just thought I would say that. Thank you. I think, I think they're still connected. I guess I would, I would argue to a C-suite that someone who isn't mentally fit 
or socially connected or feels like their work has purpose or meaning or their basic needs aren't being met isn't going to be productive at all. So we've got to do those first if you want any of the other things to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. I think wellness increases productivity big time. Um, and I, I did have one question. Um, it seems like with the shift to digital, office spaces are getting smaller, but it almost feels like they're going to get larger with increased collaborative areas. Does that make sense? Is that a shift that you're seeing? So right now, um, our research is showing, and this is back from December, that 42% of the companies still thought that there would be some sort of contraction. Um, probably they're hoping there's gonna be some sort of contraction because their offices have been sitting vacant and they've been paying operational costs on them for a year. Um, they've seen travel and other expenses come down, so that's helped. I think that as we begin to prototype this, one of the approaches we're talking about with our clients is what are the anchors? What are the things that are gonna take space and are gonna be really hard to change? So architecture is inherently rigid and we're talking about something that needs to be exponentially fluid. So that tension is what we're trying to solve for. Um, as spaces ebb and flow and people's needs, how often they need to come to the office, as we're trying to understand this, um, we can't just solve it through furniture. We can't just solve it through technology. So we're trying to look at those anchors and then develop a framework for adjustment around that. Um, do we have it all figured out? No, um, but I think we're, we're kind of all working through that. Uh, it, uh... I don't know, it's weird. Um, do you ever see a possibility of giving the employee freedom to choose not even just the office, but like there's a collaborative space just down the street from Stantec that is, I mean, just employees decide to go to a different space rather than an office? I, I, think, I think you're so right. Um, I will say that some of my thinking around this is maybe a little bit more progressive. My um, Sister is an expat, an organizational behavioral expert. She trains some of the top management teams in the world, um, everyone from Nike and DuckDuckGo to all kinds of digital startups. She's a digital nomad. She has refused to work at an office for five years. Um, she's currently, I'll give her a little plug, she's currently partnering with a designer from IDEO, writing a book on the remote work experience and, and how do you equitize this and do exactly what you're saying. So I am a firm believer that third space becomes more and more important to this conversation. It isn't just home and it isn't just office. My concern and the piece that I think we all need to solve for is those third spaces have been hurt the most by what's happened. Brick and mortar is hanging on by a lifeline. Retail is hanging on, coffee shops, co-working spaces are hanging on. Um, we saw this week CBRE made a huge investment in the co-working space called Industrious to help companies ebb and flow. This is a similar model to another company called Notel with a K um, that was less around the individual ownership of co-working, like I, Heather went out and bought a membership or Stantec goes out and buys memberships to help their employees do this throughout the world. Um, I think co-working is gonna get bigger. I think it's gonna become more important. Um, I also think we need to start advocating for more green spaces. We need to start advocating for outdoor activated green spaces. Um, we need to figure out a way to use technology to help small businesses stay competitive to companies like Amazon. So we only have a few more minutes left and I have two questions. So we'll sure. see if you can get them in. So um, the first is asking how to deal with leadership that's reluctant to embrace remote work since this is all a trust-based system. And then the second question, just so you have them both, is if you have any advice for college graduates entering the design field in this new atmosphere. Okay. Um, on the trust side, I think that em employers do understand how hard it is to attract and retain top talent. It is still the number one thing that we get asked to do is one of our goals as an organization is, this is what I hear when I, when I walk into a room. We want to attract and retain the top. The um, that will continue to be important. I think one of the amazing things that this has done is it's allowed the talent war to go global. Since I don't have to go to the office any day, I, I can work for all of these companies. So um, 
it's, it's easy to say this, it's harder to put into practice, but if companies don't trust their employees, then, then why are they working there? And if you, if you feel like your employer doesn't trust you, there, there's some fundamental problems there. It might not be the right fit over the long haul. Um, and if it's not the right fit, you're going to learn something and find something new. Um, I, ultimately, I don't think the companies that don't have trust are going to hold on to their top talent. So I think that problem in some ways kind of solves itself. They go elsewhere. Um, advice for college grads. I think I said it before. Put yourself out there. Um, people, you need to stay top of mind for people. Um, connect with them on LinkedIn. Ask them for 15 minutes, 30 minute virtual coffee if people aren't meeting in person right now. Um, have a solid resume. For me, the first thing I look for is your why. Um, why do you want to be a designer? What are you passionate about? Help me understand what you're going to bring to the team um, and, and who you are, because ultimately it's incredibly hard to motivate people to do things they're not interested in. So I need to know what drives you um, in order to see if it's, it's the right cultural fit for the team. Um, network, 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 go to networking events. Jenna and I are big in Crew Detroit, uh, welcoming to everyone of all genders. Um, it is find a network. ULI has great programs, AIA. I don't know any on the gaming side, but I'm sure they're out there. Get involved. It's the best way to meet people. And your personal network is what's going to drive your career. Help other people and that will pay back. Absolutely. I completely 100% agree with everything you just said. Um, speaking of Crew Detroit, we have, we can plug the U Crew event if you, do you have any details on that? I will actually be speaking at the U Crew event. It's on March 26th, it's virtual. Um, we're gonna be doing a couple different sessions. I'm gonna help people um, develop your why statement, like how do you pitch yourself? So if you're interested, and then I'll share real quick, if you, if you haven't, if you go to Stantec's website on our diversity, equity, and inclusion, we are offering scholarships and paid internships for anyone in a STEAM major. So it's anyone that self-identifies as a minority, whether that's racial or gender or LGBTQ, um, up to $20,000 in scholarships and a paid internship. The applications are open until the end of March. So. Um, I would love to see someone from Michigan get some scholarships. So please take advantage of it. Yes, that's incredible. I, I will follow up with the directors of all the programs to get that scholarship information out. Um, I know it's listed on our website, but we'll, we'll make sure we send it around. So, well, it is 7.15. So thank you so much for so much time tonight and some really great ideas to get people thinking about where we're heading and and all of the things that um, we have to look forward to as we get back into the world. So thank you, Heather. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much for having me. Thanks, Heather. Emily, do I need to do anything to end it? Oh, Emily left. Um, I'm here. I can. Okay. I can end the, the Zoom and the other one, okay? All right, great. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Have a great night. Bye.